everybody. This is Anindzi Awana coming to you from Awana Holdings Note Edition. So some of you have uh, formerly known this as Awana Holdings uh, with Nova Notes when I was located in Northern Virginia. But of course, I've since retired from the federal government back in December. And uh, so now here I am here with uh, Awana Holdings Note Edition. And um, so for those of you who are new to my channel or haven't seen any of my previous interviews with Nova Notes, let me give you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm retired from the United States Navy after 20 years, and that was almost 20 years ago. And then I went to work as a, a contracting officer for the federal government, and I did that for 16 years. And like I said, I just retired from the federal government as a contracting officer back in December of uh, 2021. And um, in doing that, I started my business, Awana Holdings. And when I started my business, I started my business in 2018. And I decided that I wanted to do fix and flips. But lo and behold, I ran across mortgage note investing and I changed my whole um, business plan. And, and I shifted everything over to mortgage note investing. And then of course, after that, the pandemic hit. So we really weren't able to go out and meet a lot of people. However, I was meeting a lot of people online and um, you know across the internet and, and got to meet a, a whole lot of people that I probably wouldn't have otherwise met. So what I started doing was these interviews with people in the note industry and bringing on different people to talk about different areas of note investing. And uh, so enough about me. So my guest that I have here today with me is Mr. Marco Barrio, and he is going to be talking to us about seller financing. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Mr. Marco Barrio. Thank you so much, Marco, for joining me. Thank you, Lee. I'm excited to do this with you. <laughs> I was I was happy when you asked me to do it. With you, I so. know, I know. I, you did another one a while back, and I loved that presentation. I was like, "Oh, I got to get him on my show." <laughs> <laughs> Ask him some questions. So, Marco, tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, you know, how did you get into note investing, or how long have you been note investing? You know, what got you in, interested in it? Well, my background. We can we'll we'll skip the slide I have on it later. I'll just tell you now. Okay. Um, I um I grew up in the Maryland D.C. Virginia area where you lived a long time. See, uh, I grew up in Maryland, and um, then I went to college in Boston because um, well, I went to a school called Emerson College uh -huh. long time ago, <laughs> and uh, and that's because Emerson, um, among other things, specializes in uh, film and television production of people who are going into media and entertainment. Um, so I wanted to be a director. Yeah. And um, I went to Emerson and uh, loved it. And within a week of graduation, I moved to Los Angeles to start my career. Nice. Uh, in fact, during my time at Emerson, you know, some people spend a semester abroad, they go to Europe. I came to Los Angeles and I hey. interned at a company that made music videos. Well, hey, if you're going to be directing, <laughs> you got to be in L.A. That's I was there. Doing, I was, right? Yeah, it was like it was my job to go wake up the our, our main director uh if he'd have a noon meeting, I'd have to go to his house about 1030, make sure he was awake. Oh, wow. That was that was the kind of world I was working in. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's showbiz, I got the glamour early. Yeah, nice. And, and so how many years did you do that? For I many years? Did that for a long time. What did I put in there? Yeah, it, about 24 years okay, in, that's in a long the time. entertainment industry. I I ended up producing television shows and and then oversaw post production and and um, switch gears. Um, I'm on my third or fourth career here. I've lost count. <laughs> but within media and entertainment, I shifted from working on in the production office, which is a lot of hours and freelance work. I, I, understand. Family, I understand. I understand. I mean, family. I just you know I just retired from the federal government. That was like my second retirement. So I was. I was thinking that, you know, going into note investing is going to be, you know, the next thing that I'm focusing on now full time, um, working the note investing business. And then I thought, well, really, that's not even so much full time. So I'm like, what else could I be doing? <laughs> you, know, so actually, business. I, you know, Z, we never talked about it. My mom worked for the federal government. Yeah. So I grew up in, in Maryland and she worked, um, she worked uh, for a senator from Michigan for a long time. Nice. And 
and then she actually worked for President Carter. She was a she was a, a employee in the Carter White House. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, nothing but federal government up there. So a lot of it. I know. I know. <laughs> That's all you can do. <laughs> and military, which you did too. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I then I I switched gears and I I got a job working in I was in post production services. Mm -hmm. which is all the all the technical stuff that happens after footage leaves the set okay. so I'd always been immersed in technology to some degree but I got really deep into it there I worked for a big company called Technicolor which over 100 years ago invented color motion picture film yeah. but um, we were at this point launching digital services for finishing uh feature films. Mm -hmm. I started in television there and then I moved into feature films. So we'd scan the whole movie and make tons and tons and tons of data on these huge servers. And, and that's how we'd finish the movie. That's how all movies are finished today, but it was brand new when I was oh, in right. So that was a lot of fun. We had projects going all over the world uh, for the studios. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> but, but I burned out on okay. that. Um, yeah. Real estate investing or anything over that period of time? Or did you just straight jump into Moore's note investing. Oh, I see. So, so I left that industry. Um, it, they, it, it was time for me to move on. They didn't need a, uh, you know, moderately well-paid, uh, <laughs> dude behind a desk anymore. The industry was changing and, uh, and, and, and I think my patience was waning as well. So <laughs> the, the nice thing is, and I think it's, you know, it's something I like to share with a lot of people. It's never too late to reinvent. Mm -hmm. And I knew that, there would be um, lots of opportunities for me if I just, you know, looked for something else. So I decided to look for something outside the entertainment industry. Yeah. For a few years, I tried a few small uh, e-commerce businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned a bit from that. Um, but then um, I started going to local uh, meetup um, uh, in Southern California. Uh, it was for investors, by investors. Okay. And, you know, every week is a different topic, you know, after one week, month, every, every month, rather, after one month, I'm going to fix and flip the next month. Oh, no, that's terrible. I'm going to buy, buy, go buy apartment buildings. Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> and then by about month six, I said, you know, I better pick something. But pick one, right? <laughs> so everybody goes through that phase. I know I did, you know, yeah. like I said, it's fix and flips. Oh, then it was multifamily. And then, oh, no, I don't want to do that anymore. Let me do something else. <laughs> yep. Yep. So um, as fate would have it, the next month, there was a panel of note investors. Um, and it really made sense to me. There was people who were originating hard money loans. And as you know, they're within note investing. There are a lot of different niches. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, the, the person who connected with me at that time, um, some people may know him. He's out on the, the some of the forums and stuff. His name's Gerald Lemoyne. Mm -hmm. And he was, back in the day, one of the first people to start buying non-performing seconds coming out of the last financial crisis. And uh, it made a lot of sense to me. So that's where I started out. Okay. All right. And then you just went straight into, did you do like all of like, well, like I, I was going to say like a lot of us do, but, but like I did where you went through all of the, um, um, the training sessions and, and, you know, the gurus and the coaches for this and, <laughs> and all of that. You know, what, what do they say uh, uh, where you analyze everything? Um, uh, analysis paralysis. That's what it is. I'm trying to think of. <laughs> I did. I, I, I did everything all at once. I, um, I'm more of a hands on person. Mm -hmm. I think that comes from my experience in film and television. That's a really, you know, we got to do this. Let's just dive in and figure it out while we do it yeah. for better or worse. And so. I did a bit of that, but I also uh, did take some educational courses. My my first course, I mean, I read read some some of the books that everybody recommends out there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, my first uh, was uh, uh, Kimberly Banks Fawcett and and Liz Broomer Smith, and 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 at the time there was a third person who was working with them, and they run an educational program. Even though they don't specifically teach about junior liens, it was still all the basics. Um, and I find that I find there aren't as many differences maybe as some people advertise between juniors and seniors and mm -hmm. some of that stuff. I think you understand the fundamentals and you can find a way through it. Right. Um, but around that time, I also bought my first non-performing second and mm -hmm. said, let's see, let's see where this goes. And that was it. And so what got you into um, seller financing in particular? 
Well, yeah, that was a, a progression. Um, I, um, I bought all types of non-performing notes. Again, I, I, I find it all to be similar. So um, a lot of my education was because was stemming from buying different assets because they were different than what I'd ever owned before. So I wanted to own one in bankruptcy. So I'll go find one in bankruptcy so I can see what I can learn there. I want one that's in a state maybe that someone thinks is difficult. So sure, I'll, I'll give that a try okay. and first liens and whatever. Um, so I did that for a while. And then I, I almost can't remember how it started, but um I, of course, you know, continue to go to conferences, which is always a good thing to do and continue mm -hmm. to listen to webinars and anything I can learn from. I'm, I still do a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, but seller financing kept coming up. And um, you know what it really was, is I was looking to start a business where I could um, I could I could use my own capital. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested at the time. There were some there were some horror stories that, that some people in the industry remember with people seeking out JB partners and. Right. And I decided to avoid that. And I wasn't, I'm not the, the person who's going to go start a fund. Right. So I wanted to build up my own capital reserve. So I was buying assets in my retirement account for someday, you know, mm -hmm. to spend that money. But at this point, I decided I didn't want to go back to my old job and any job in the entertainment industry. Right. <laughs> so I thought I should find something to help me buy groceries. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, I'll start marketing for seller finance notes. Um there was a, a good learning curve there. Of course, I took some more education to, to learn about that. But uh, the learning curve really was um, learning marketing. I'm not sure that's emphasized on how hard and how much work that is to find seller finance note leads. We'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. And also um, getting good at talking to note holders. Mm -hmm. uh, that was there was, a, there was fear there for me. Yeah. And, and it took a lot of practice. We did it. Practice. So <laughs> you did it. So you have a, um, a presentation that you're going to do for us, yeah. and I'm, I'm anxious to get to that because I know it's really good. I've seen it. I've seen you do it for another um, another show that you had done previously. So that was one of the reasons I really wanted to get you on here to um, have you do that presentation today. Okay. okay. You ready for it? I'll yeah, start it and do take it. Your time. You, you should be able to share your screen with no problem. Okay. I'm going to start this. And then, whoops, better share my screen first. Hold on. Don't worry, we'll edit that out. <laughs> I don't care. Well, you might care, but I don't care. Uh, so here we go. Yeah, there. There we go. All right. Awesome. Now, what are you? Ooh, what are you seeing? I'm not seeing anything. I see. I see your slide. It says um, investing in seller finance mortgage notes. Okay, so let's do that. Do you see the presenter yeah, view now? Uh, full screen, yes. Mm -hmm. Full screen, wonderful. Okay, okay. then we're good All to go. All right, so hold okay. on. Let's let's go from here. And so Marco is going to go into um, seller finance mortgage notes for us. Thank you so much. Go ahead. Thanks, see. Um, so yeah, you, you've seen a bit of this presentation before, but I'll try and keep it interesting for you. Love it. But I still got uh, more questions, I think. So unless you've gone back and included them in your new slides, I got, oh, okay. I got some good okay. questions for you. <laughs> okay. Well, we better get into it. Okay. Oops. This doesn't want to advance. There we go. All right. So I've talked about me. Um, Anyway, today, what I do, um, we talked about all my history earlier in the intro. Uh, today, what I do is I run a company called Porch Swing Funding. Um, I've been doing that for a few years now. And what I like about it both most, to be honest, I talk about the transition. I, I did it initially for financial reasons. But what I discovered is um, in talking to seller finance uh, note holders around the country, it, um, it, it feeds my soul. It, it, I found something I like to do, yeah. um, completely uh, stumbled into it um, through a series of events. Um, I'm convinced that there are other ways to make more money mm -hmm. in real estate investing and note investing. Uh, it's a grind, but I get to deal with the most incredible people and they all share their stories with me, which is amazing. Great, right? I know. I love it. I'm, I'm like, how did I not know about this all, all these years? <laughs> It's wonderful. It's wonderful. Sometimes they're sad stories and I'm, and I'm sort of honored that they'll share it with me, mm -hmm. but everybody when they're 
looking whether it's to sell property or paper, there's a reason behind it. And, um, and, and again, people are very open with what's going on in their life. So, right. so it's, it's, so that's what I do today. And I really enjoy it. Some, some side hustles in real estate as yeah. well. And, uh, some <laughs> attention deficit, certainly, but, uh, but it is what you it got is. Lots, lots to do. <laughs> yeah. So um, I thought I'd cover for the audience today what notes are. I'm sure a lot of people know, but, uh, but let's make sure the foundations are there. Yeah. Um, types of notes that are out there. Uh, purchasing and creating seller finance notes. That's what I focus on today. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation, of course. And then ways to make money. And I've got a few case studies as well. That's always good. Yeah. So here's the high level. I'm a note buyer, I, which that means that I buy paper instead of property. I invest in paper. As silly as that sounds, I'm just investing in documents that happen to uh, create a promise for a, a, a borrower or a, um, a buyer uh, to pay a, a debt obligation mm -hmm. in exchange for a real estate transaction. The security is the property. Okay, so I buy mortgage notes, promissory notes, deeds of trust, and mortgages. Um, a promissory note is nothing more than a promise to pay. Um, see, if I if I asked to borrow fifty bucks from you, um, of course you trust me, and you would loan me fifty bucks, and I promise to pay you back in a month or two. <laughs> but you might be smart to put a paper. Put it on paper. <laughs> yes. Did I, did I mention that I was a contracting officer? <laughs> uh, you might be smart to get that paper and, <laughs> and, and have me sign it that I promise to pay you. Well, that's all a promissory note is, is a promise to pay. And it's, it's logic would, would dictate what's going to be there, but it's going to, when, when one reads a promissory note, they'll know how much was, how much credit was extended and mm -hmm. to whom and who it's owed to and what are the terms for repaying it. What happens if it's not paid back? Um, and one thing to mention is promissory notes are not recorded. Okay, and I'll talk about what is recorded on the next slide, but it's just a contract. Keep the original because that's it. You won't find it anywhere else, okay? Now, what makes promissory notes in real estate valuable is that they're secured by real estate. So if the payments don't come, then the process starts to for the lien holder to make themselves whole financially by uh, through the property. And the document that enables that depends on the state that you live in. It's gonna be called a deed of trust or a mortgage. That pledges, that document says, if I don't pay the promissory note, which it's gonna to refer to dated such and such for such and such money from whom to whom, if I don't pay that, you can come after my house. That's essentially what it says. That document is recorded with the county. One thing that I've learned a lot about in note investing is title. And I think all experienced real estate investors are constantly learning title. Mm. By recording a document against a property, it, it creates a flaw in title, it creates a lien, but it's really a flaw in title. Mm -hmm. So that's a, very, that's a very important thing. And in buying notes, of course, we look at title because the property is only worth as much as the title uh, can back up. And we're not going to go too deep into that today, but <laughs> bad title equals a bad property. Yeah. And there can be a problem if you're looking to the property to be paid off and the title's not there, then the property really isn't there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's all I'll say about that. But deeds and trusts and mortgages are recorded with the county. Now, there's something else, and you'll hear about these all the time in the seller finance world. Uh, they're called contract for deeds. Sometimes they're called land contracts. Uh, sometimes they're called real estate contracts, not to be confused with purchase and sale agreements, which are also real estate contracts. But what's unique about them is if I, Z, if I sell up my, my home to you and I agree to carry back seller financing, so you give me a down payment and then we agree on terms and say, you're gonna pay me this much, every month with interest until the debt obligation is paid in full. If we use a promissory note and a mortgage or a promissory note and a deed of trust, when we close 
on our initial transaction, you get title to the house, right? Mm -hmm. The promissory note for deed of trust and mortgage. The other option is a contract for deed or land contract. Now I compare these a lot to <coughs> car loans. I compare these a lot to car loans because mm -hmm. um, have you ever heard the term, if, if you pay off your car, you get the pink slip. I don't know if they're pink anymore, mm -hmm. um, but uh, at least not in California, they're not. Mm. But so with a car loan, the lender keeps the title until the debt obligation is paid. And then the buyer gets the title. It's the same thing with a contract for deed. So if I see, if I sell you my home and we use a contract for deed, then we'll close our initial transaction. You'll sign a contract for deed. We'll record that, but I'll keep the title to the home. There'll be no assignment of the title to you. I'll hold on to the title. Excuse me. So, so it's it's not like with a traditional. Um, let's say I, I was buying a traditional note, mortgage note, or I was a traditional mortgage note um, seller. No, I was buying the note. Let's say I was buying a note, mm -hmm. and I don't own the property. I just own the loan. Correct. So, are you saying that for this contract for deed? I own the property and the lien. Okay, I just want to clarify. <laughs> you sure do. And guess what? Guess what? A lot of note investors don't like doing owning property. Right. Right. Now, it's unavoidable if if one such as myself wants to do a lot of volume in the seller finance note buying world. Um, I I recommend getting comfortable owning property in this way because. This will limit the number of deals you can do right. if you don't buy contract for deeds. Now, some people don't like them, and I understand that. Again, I buy a volume. This is how I mm -hmm. pay my mortgage and, and buy my groceries. This right. is all I do. Yeah. But as a side hustle, you might consider whether or not you want to touch contract for deeds. Yeah. They received a bad rap. One thing to be aware of, they received a bad rap. Coming out of the last financial crisis, 2008 period, there were a lot of REOs out there. A lot of terrible properties that hadn't been cared for. And a couple large companies in particular went and bought up as many as they could for nothing mm -hmm. and sold them to buyers using contract for deeds. And in reality, those buyers shouldn't have been qualified for those loans. Now, it's amazing, right? We got into this problem in the first place because a lot of mortgages were written to borrowers who shouldn't have been given mortgages. I'm a little too deep because I have a couple of questions on that later. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Go ahead, say what you would say. Okay. Say what you would say. Um, <laughs> but these large companies took advantages of the fact that with a contract for deed, they still held on to the title. The company held on to the title. So instead of, at least the way most of the laws were written at that time, instead of in a, a foreclosure, it's more like an eviction. Mm -hmm. It's faster and it's cheaper to get them out. Mm -hmm. So it ruined a lot of people's lives. Yeah. And these companies ultimately have been penalized. Right. But what happens if a group of people do something bad and we're all part of the same larger sense group of people, real estate investors, we're vilified sometimes. Okay. Rather, Z is good, I'm good, but not all of us are good. Not all real estate investors are good, I understand. Mm -hmm. So the state legislatures love to legislate around issues like that. It's in the paper. It caused people pain. We're going to pass laws. Mm. So be aware that contract for deeds aren't what they used to be. In Texas, they, for practical purposes, don't exist anymore. Title and companies won't insure, insure them anymore. So are, are, are contracts for, or I should say, are lease options considered the same thing as contract for deed? Well, they're, 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 they're close cousins. Similar. A lease option is an option. Okay, it just says you will you will be my tenant until such time you exercise an option. It's two separate documents. You'll be my tenant until such time you exercise an option, and perhaps if you agree upon it, some of the lease payment could go towards the option consideration or not. But 
there's a that that that's a similar topic and that some people have been taken advantage of with lease right. options. Because with the lease options, I still own the the actual asset. As as yeah, well. uh, yeah, kind of stinks if you're lease optioning a property and you think, gee, I've been making payments on time for a year. And then the property owner says, yeah, I'm not going to let you exercise that option. Well, yeah. you can lawyer up, but you may not have the means to do right. that. Um, so, so yes, laws are being passed the around those. Way, the same way that you would have to evict them with a contract for D. So let me ask you a question. With the contract for D, considering, let's say I was the owner of that, um, that uh, no, that deed. Am, am I then responsible to pay the taxes and, and upkeep maintenance or whatever for the property, not the buyer? That's right. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah. No wonder nobody wants that. <laughs> Ultimately, yes. And, and if the buyer doesn't keep the grass mowed and that particular town has a, a policy that they find property owners who don't take care of the property, that's okay. Bill doesn't go to the person living in the house. The bill goes to the owner. To me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. okay. So be aware. Be aware. I'm buying. <laughs> All right. I'm buying one in Michigan as we speak. But oh gosh. <laughs> there you go. In a little town called Pigeon. 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 It's right by Bad Axe. Right by Bad Axe, which oh. is right near, right near where my mom grew up. Bad Axe. You know how often I get to talk to people who've heard ever heard of Bad Axe, Michigan? Bad Axe. I know I'm not supposed to buy emotionally, but that's why I'm buying the name. I'm saying, that's not good. <laughs> just, just the name is not good. Bad Axe. Bad Axe. <laughs> that's not a good thing. Okay. So, okay. do you have any more questions? Yeah, no, not that? for that. I, I got you on that. You, you answered my question. That. That's good. You good? Should I move on? Yes, yes. All right. Here's my least favorite slide. <laughs> uh, I do have some questions on that. Right. <laughs> when, um, again, we have this financial crisis. It created a lot of pain for a lot of consumers and homeowners and and uh, and families. And so that meant some laws needed to be passed. Now, big bad lenders did big bad things, and we needed some guardrails, in my opinion, in place. Mm -hmm. uh, I.e., we shouldn't be lending to people who can't afford it because it doesn't do anybody any favors in the long run. We all paid for that in the mm -hmm. end, mm -hmm. right? I agree. So the Dodd Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act uh, went into effect in 2014. And what it set out to do is strengthen some existing laws around lending, and, and it created some new ones, and it created a new agency called the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, that's all great, mm -hmm. but when I sell a house and I sell or finance it, I don't believe I look like Wells Fargo or Bank of America when they sell a house. It's a, it's a much more hands-on, personalized transaction. Mm -hmm. However... At its first draft, this act would have wrapped up all lending on homes that are owner occupied. Okay. Um, so, why I have this slide here is a couple things to clear up some misconceptions and to say that Dodd Frank is not a bad thing and not something to be scared of if you understand it. Yeah. Some people are very scared of Dodd Frank. They say, "Ooh, Dodd Frank!" <laughs> like it's "Ooh, the, you know." The, the what ghost. does that mean, right? <laughs> ooh, no, but Dodd Frank. Okay, what about Dodd Frank? Well, <laughs> first of all, if they say "Ooh," but what about Dodd Frank? And the loan is extended for a what's called a business purpose loan. So, like an investor loan. If I loan to D, uh, if I sell D, uh, sorry, D Z a house. <laughs> I know it D Z a house. And um, she tells me she's going to put a tenant in that house. Okay, great. Dodd Frank doesn't apply. It's not owner occupied. Mm -hmm. Now I'm smart, and I'm going to make Z sign a document at our closing, mm -hmm. uh, in the form of an affidavit swearing that she's not going to live in the house. Mm -hmm. So if she does live in the house, hey, she told me she wasn't going to do it. Mm -hmm. That's that's between her and. And, and so whatever. that would be considered business to business. That's business to business. Exactly. It's not owner occupied. We're not kicking families ultimately out of their homes. That's okay. what this law was intended for. Okay. Um, 
it affects things like licensing and the terms of a loan and the underwriting guidelines. And we're not going to go into all that stuff in detail today. <laughs> A whole different show <laughs> unless you want me to another another i have you back again and we can go in depth into dodd frank <laughs> awana holdings uh at, at night yes. uh, for those who have trouble going to sleep marco <laughs> will recite the dodd frank act <laughs> it'll be so interesting i can't wait <laughs> So anyway, here's what I do, and here's how I handle this when I'm buying seller finance loans. I ask how many loans the uh, originator, the, the, the note holder, has originated within the 12-month period surrounding when the particular loan is. So if Z is selling me a loan and she created it in January of 2021, I say, great, I, I protect myself. I look back 12 months and forward 12 months. But I ask her, did you create any other loans in that period? I mostly deal with mom and pops mm -hmm. who created exactly one seller finance loan their whole life. Right. So almost always the answer is no. Mm -hmm. And then of course, because I'm smart, I have them sign when we close saying, yep, I only created this one and this was the maximum interest rate and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So Dodd-Frank, as you might guess where I'm going, has an exemption for anybody who creates one in a 12-month period. That's tier one. And then there's another exemption tier, which is up to three in a 12-month period. Okay. For the most part, as long as the sellers are within that three, I have no concerns. Mm -hmm. If it's only one, I have really no concerns. If it's two or three, uh, if, <laughs> yeah, it, it, if, if the, if it's not an individual who originated, it's an LLC, mm -hmm. there are a few things to be aware of, but then I start to, um, to, um, be concerned with what the, um, government uh, refers to as ability to repay and residual income. Again, remember, we're just trying to protect homeowners, right. owner occupied homeowners to make sure they're not going to. Pay, you know, the, the, the weight of the financial responsibility is not going to cave in upon them and they're going to lose their home. And so, so yes, and so, but wait, so are you making that decision or are you sending it to an underwriter? Really neither. Um, the, 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 the bet has been made at that point. Here's how I handle this. Let's say I'm buying a loan and um, only one payment has been made and it's a newly originated loan. And that originator has already originated two other loans in a 12 month period. I'm gonna to ask to see their underwriting file. I'm gonna to ask to make sure that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to verify to make sure that they, they used a third party such as a mortgage loan underwriter or mortgage loan originator mm -hmm. to verify the borrower's ability to repay, okay? If it's just one, I'm not that concerned with it because that rule doesn't apply. The residual income is a is a similar type of uh, uh, evaluation. Okay. So I when I originate these loans, I use a third party. It's actually not a requirement. That's some misinformation out there right. to use a third party, but it's smart to do. Okay. okay. So that's that, that's that's the biggest thing to be aware of. And again, we're not covering this in detail. Right. Oh, Ask your advisor. Seek legal advice on this. Use your team. But I want people to know buying seller finance notes on their own isn't a problem, especially if only one's been created in a 12 month period. OK, so so my question then is if um, let's say someone hasn't used a uh, an underwriter, how how I guess comfortable are you in, I guess, whatever criteria that they use to determine that the borrower was um I guess qualified enough to afford the mortgage. What 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 criteria are they using to make that determination? At the end of the day, I want to make sure that I could defend myself in front of a judge. Um, so there's some judgment that goes into it. If I see that they've used a a, a licensed um, entity to uh, underwrite the borrower and make sure they have ability to repay and, and meet the residual income requirements. Um, or meet, or just, I'll say just meet those, meet those standards, mm -hmm. then I'm going to feel pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I'll also say this, there's no checklist for anybody, right. whether they're licensed or not, 
the reputable companies will document their procedures and they'll derive them from um, uh, other proven procedures that are in use. So maybe they're looking at the VA qualification terms or the yeah. FHA qualification terms or something along those lines. Okay. okay. So they're consistent. They've documented it. They're showing documentation of pay history and, and so of, of, um, of, you know, W-2s or tax returns, income, income verification, okay. things like that, things like that, credit checks, things like that. Okay. Okay. So if I were ever called, I bought the loan, it goes bad. I end up in front of a judge because uh, borrowers hired a, a counsel to defend and counsel seeking to dismiss my lien because it wasn't underwritten properly. I, I need, I want to be documented right. again, if it's two or three. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I also, by the way, I might, I might care less about the documentation. If now they have a two-year payment history, I mm -hmm. say, well, their ability to pay is, or they made two years of payments. So do what you're comfortable with. This gets into gray area. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not something to run from. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point I want to make here. Okay. Okay. No. Can okay. I make that point, Steve? Yeah, you made the point. I got it. Got it. <laughs> cool. Let's move on. <laughs> and know also that um, depending what type of entities are involved, whether it's an individual or an LLC, and especially understand that depending what states are involved, states can throw their own stuff on top of federal regulations. Mm -hmm. So be aware of that as well. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't take precedence over federal um, regulations. They would if they're more severe. They would if they're more severe. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the federal government may require this. The state of whatever bill might require this. In addition to the uh, correct, they might have something else, or it might just be a little more strict. Okay, okay. I live in a state that likes to do that. <laughs> California. Okay. All right. Cool. Dodd right. Frank. I got it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now the different types of loans. Um, Z, what kind of loans do you buy? Um, right now, I have institutional loans. Institutional loans. So institutional is when you go to Quicken Loans or you go to Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. Rocket Mortgage, whatever Quicken Loans is called now. Smaller, smaller bank. Yeah, or even the, your local credit union. Those are institutional lenders. They're lending their banks, their institutions. The other type are private lenders. They make hard money loans and uh, uh, uh fix and flip loans, bridge financing, things like that. What's the important thing to keep in mind, institutional lenders and private lenders, on any of those transactions, there are three parties involved. Mm -hmm. There's the buyer, the seller, and the lender. Yeah. Buyer and the seller, and the lender's a third party. Mm -hmm. Okay, And seller financing, there are only two, buyer and a seller. It's one of the things I love about it. Cool. It's people dealing with people, the terms can, in theory, be anything they want to be, <laughs> short of the Bob Frank stuff or a couple yeah. things, and there you avoid and state things. So one thing I wanted to ask you about, well, so with seller financing, are there um, like closing costs? So you don't use, so I'm guessing you don't use like closing costs or realtors and loan officers and stuff like that. You don't use all of that. It's, it's all you. There's always a title company. I do everything through a title company. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Even when I buy loans, I use a title company, okay. but, um, and there's, there's in title insurance. Remember I mentioned how important title is. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Z. I don't cover this a whole lot, but, mm -hmm. um, there are two types, probably a lot of types of title insurance, but two important types for these transactions, the property owners will have an owner's title policy, meaning that if if there's ever a claim on title <clears throat> and it turns out their interest in the title isn't what they thought it was, the title insurance company will pay on that claim. In other words, they'll reimburse them for the house. You know, if a long lost relative of a previous owner comes forward and says, oh, no, I, I have a deed right here to that house. They couldn't sell. They weren't allowed to sell that house. Yeah. And they do their thing and they fight it out. And the current owners quote, think they're owners. Uh, aren't really owners, title company will step in and pay them out, okay. will pay them out. I want the same thing as a lender. All those big institutional ones you see there on the left, mm -hmm. they have title policies, mm -hmm. they have title policies too. I want my, uh, uh, the balance of what I'm owed to be paid out 
if there's a claim on title and it turns out my lien is invalid. Now, how does that work? Um, I guess with CFDs and and even with the seller financing. Well, I guess you still own the property, so um, do you? So you can't require the um, the buyer or the tenant, if you will, to to carry um, homeowners insurance. You have to carry that, correct? Um, or am I? A lot of contractor deeds will stipulate that the buyers are making payments to cover the cost of homeowners insurance. Um, but the insurance homeowners, is still yeah. in your name or in your uh, company. Yeah, the, uh, the title to the house is still in my name. Mm -hmm. um, there are some insurers out there who will, now we're talking homeowners insurance. Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. which, just for everyone to be clear, we shifted a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's okay. Um, the, the, I prefer at the end of the day that the, the buyer um, get their own insurance policy, but not all insurance companies will write to somebody who's essentially a renter. Yeah, I was going to say. Try to write it as a renter policy. Yeah. Are they getting renter's insurance? Or they can't get homeowner's insurance because they don't own the home. So how how are, I guess, their interests protected? But I'll tell you right now, even title companies don't understand, but certainly insurance companies don't understand contract for deeds, CFDs, as, yeah. as he called them. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the, the TLA, the three-letter acronym for <laughs> contract for deed, TLA. Um, <laughs> Not everyone understands them. Um, it's going to be important when you get into the topic of homeowners insurance or hazard insurance to talk to an insurance agent who does, or they may sell you a policy that can't be enforced upon. They, again, they'll, they'll kind of waffle between an, an occupant's policy, which you're not occupying the property, yeah. or a renter's policy, which may not cover this. It's not really a rental. It looks like a tenant in there, but they're not really a tenant. So you need a pretty sharp insurance uh, agent on this one. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I thought about um, that. Yeah. And what, what brought so, me to that question was, um, you know, typically when I uh, purchase like a non-performer, I'll get forced place insurance on it. And, and actually I have one that, that's kind of sub-performing and like every year I, I get forced place insurance on it and then they end up because they don't, keep up with their homeowners insurance and then <laughs> you know they end up you know reimbursing me but um I was just curious how that worked with seller financing especially if, same yeah, same not, some yeah. never get around to getting the policy okay we'll we'll go with a forced place it's going to cost you double hmm. sometimes their credit isn't good enough because the insurance companies run their credit yeah that's a gotcha that a lot of people don't talk about Sometimes they can't get one. Mm. Wow. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> get good good questions. No, really good questions. Yeah. Okay, that's a good ones for you. <laughs> really good. Really good. We, we're good. We're good. We're good together. Right. Um. Okay. So, and we talked about the owner's policy for title and the lender's policy for mm -hmm. title as well. Now, to be clear, when I buy loans, existing loans, I either purchase. A, a policy in my name or if the policy so i'm buying a loan right now uh it's a land contract on a property in michigan they sold the property to the buyers <laughs> on a land contract last month so they just went through the title company just went through underwriting and issuing this title policy it's a land contract so it's an owner's policy remember the person i'm buying from is the contract owner is actually the owner of the property so it's just an owner's policy Okay. And what most title companies will let you do, they call it a date down because the policy was written so recently. They just go back to where they left off three and a half weeks ago of title search and they update their title search to today. Mm -hmm. And they'll, for a small fee, sign the, the policy to me. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I'm buying a new policy. Either lender, if it's a mortgage deed of trust, or an owner, if it's a contract for deed, land contract. Okay. Okay. But again, that that only protects your interests. That's right. Not and who really matters, Z. Yes. That's <laughs> Not who's the occupying the, the property. 
The lender's policy only protects my interest as a lender. Right. They should have an owner's policy. Absolutely. <laughs> and I will tell them that too. But okay. Yes. Yes. Clear that up. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. Um, by the way, your forced place policy mostly just protects you. Yes. If if there's a slip and fall, it may not necessarily protect protect the homeowner. Right. Right. Yeah, you 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 want to make sure the the you know yeah. the Wizard of Oz tornado doesn't come and take it away. I know. I right? hope not. Or doesn't burn they, down. I hope not. But of course not. Of course me, not. Of course, of course but, it's not an issue. I, I know one of my um um buyers had a fire in in the house last year, and and they called me and um. Because they didn't, they let their insurance lapse, their homeowners insurance lapse, and I guess the servicing company had sent them something about insurance on the property, but it was on my force place insurance. So they assumed that you know it was going to cover whatever happened in the house, and I had to explain to them that um no, <laughs> not your insurance. You have to get your own insurance. Uh, you know, thankfully, you know, no one was hurt and the house didn't burn down, but I was like, wow. So, so this, it's yeah. just eye opening that, you know, with the seller financing that you just brought that up. And I didn't, I didn't think, think that um that was the case. It's the same. It's the same. It's all the same. Just again, in, in this slide is the perfect slide to mention that institutional and private are three parties, buyer, seller, lender. Seller finance two parties, but the documents are the same. You got a note and mortgage or note and deed of trust or the land contract, contract for deed. And so do you um board your seller finance loans with a servicer? Or and so most servicers accept seller finance loans, or um are they unclear on them like a lot of the insurance people might be? <laughs> well, um, the servicers I use, it's never been a problem. It's a it's a short list of about two or three okay. that I, I've yeah, worked I with. Say probably not all of them, except some. Really, of them. Yeah, I, I I think the determination really most people will find is if they deal with uh, 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 individual investors. Um, any any loan servicing company I can think of, and I'm sure someone can prove me wrong on this, but I may not be wrong. Anybody who accepts just a single loan from a single investor. Is going to also accept seller finance loans. That's a, yeah. That's a, it, yeah. There's there's big servicers out there who don't deal with our kind. They deal with customers who have hundreds of loans boarded at any yeah. given time. It's much different operation. With the funds and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so this is the top level institutional private seller finance, and then, you know. Z and I, we go to the, the no conferences and run the calls. So what do you invest in? What do you invest in? Performing or not performing? Da, 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 da. It's, it's, again, there's real estate investing, which is a niche within investing. I'm a real estate investor. Oh, what kind of real estate? Well, I invest in notes. So that's another niche. Within notes, there's more niches. The more. I only, I, I mean, it's a, I, maybe you're one of them, Z. I don't know, but I run into a lot of people. I only buy non-performing seconds. <laughs> Nothing else. Like if I came to you with the best, you know, performing first, you have to buy more. Like you don't know how to underwrite that. It's a loan with a borrower <laughs> in a home. I mean, to me, it's, it's good to be experienced and understand there's only small differences. I am so glad you have on this slide that 30 plus days late is a non-performing loan. I, I recently had a note come across my desk and they said that it was performing. And I'm like, no, that's non-performing. I was looking at the pay history and it was like one, 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 which meant that they had been 30 days late. <laughs> you know all that time and you're trying yeah. to sell it to me as a performing note um i don't think so z the the politically correct term is sub performing yeah yes. sub performing they're not performing correct <laughs> performing yeah. or you're not yeah i could i could wedge that in there sub performing you know. <laughs> that's how i see it but it ain't performing i consider it non-performing so i of right. course i passed on it but i was just like mm, okay well, so the, the big one where people love to fudge is re-performing. Mm. 
you and I I'm sure, have seen many, 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 I'm sure, loans where people say it's a performing loan. They they just wrote a check for five thousand dollars last week, and their first payment of you know monthly payment of four hundred twelve dollars is due to beginning of next month. Yeah, no. that's not re-performing. <laughs> They, you know, borrowed from their cousin the five thousand the house, <laughs> but I want to see that they can make payments for. Yeah. For me, it's twelve months. And yeah, this, I was going to say at least people love to debate over what reperforming is. It's probably really twelve months. I want to see that they've been able to get through twelve months of making the payments. Right. You know, give or take with you know pretty close to when the due date is. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, performing is no payments more than thirty days late. Mm -hmm. So here's what we got. <laughs> I focus on seller finance performing. <laughs> Have I bought everything else here? I've never bought a, no, I bought private. Uh, yeah, I bought everything. I bought every square here. Mm -hmm. I Okay, I've never bought re-performing private. That would be weird. Non-performing <laughs> private, I wouldn't touch that. But that's just me. But I focus on these nice mom and pops uh, who have a loan they've been collecting payments on for some time and for one reason or another something's changed in their life and they need to sell it or want to sell it that's mm -hmm. what I do okay, okay. I don't know if the 2022 date is out yet Tracy Z um, spends uh, time breaking down a report that comes from a, a, a seller financed um, a provider of, of list of seller finance note sellers. It's called Advanced Seller Data Services. Mm -hmm. I have both of their links on the bottom of the slide. Okay. And um, Scott at Advanced Seller Data, um, because of the nature of his business, he's pulling county records from all over the county looking for seller finance note holders. And he processes the data and creates some, some statistics. And then Tracy spends a lot of time um, formatting them in a way that they're a little bit more useful, <laughs> and easier to di easy to digest mm -hmm. for people like me. So it's a it's a small market, but it's a sizable enough market that there's 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 enough to go around. Again, this was 2021 during the pandemic, mind you. Mm -hmm. There were 54,443 residential seller finance loans created. Their combined balances of just the residential portion. I'm going to point those out because I focus a little more on residential. A lot. Mm -hmm. 14 billion in balance. A lot. Just just <laughs> um, now, was that what, you know, compare that to the numbers that Quicken Loans and Wells Fargo are doing? It's small. Yeah. But there's a lot of them out there. Yeah. The balances went up. Uh, you make sense the property values were going up. There. <clears throat> but they went up almost 16% in that one year. Um, over the last five years, was it just a blip? No, there's 123 billion in balances created over the five years leading up and including 2021. Wow. And, and this is what's interesting. Remember, I'm marketing to mom and pops who've mostly created one. 84% of these loans were created by one-off sellers. 10% uptick versus prior year. And people assume seller finance loans are zero down payment. Hmm. The average down payment was 23%. Not mm -hmm. bad. That makes a better loan, of course, when there's more down payment. Mm -hmm. Okay. I had a question in regards. So <clears throat> not, not so much for um, down payments, but since we've been in, um, I don't know, maybe for the last maybe eight, 10 years, we've been in a historically low um, interest rate, mortgage interest rate um, environment. What does that look like for um, seller finance notes? Are, are your interest rates really high? They're probably probably the same as what we're at now on average since they've doubled over the last few months. You know, interest rates and in seller financing are, um, <laughs> I, I, I chuckle. Um, I, I see more loans than you could imagine with 0% interest rates. Oh, wow. Or one or two or three or 4% interest rates. The zero is I just, you know, I talk to people on the phone when they, they call and they have a note and I say, wow, the 0%. Yeah, I feel bad charging interest. Wow, 3%, 4%. <laughs> That's, you were pretty generous there. 
Wow. Well, you know, that's what the banks were charging. Right. Yeah. At that time. But the banks don't lend their money. They lend my money and Z's money and mm -hmm. you know, everyone else's money. And they get bailed out when things really go mm -hmm. bad. <laughs> but I don't. And that's my money. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't my interest rate, because I'm taking on a more risk, be higher than what Bank of America is charging? It should be. Now, it's too late. The cake is already baked when they call me and they have the note. But I gently explain that, well, in the seller finance industry, it's more common to see 7 8 9% interest rates mm -hmm. as an ideal rate, although we see them all over. And investors in the seller finance note industry, are, you know, they, they need to achieve a certain yield. Mm -hmm. So the discount will be a little bit more because your interest rate is less. I've never had anybody not understand that. Mm -hmm. um, there's other things they don't understand, but but that they typically understand <coughs> that way. Right. And um, Makes sense. so so interest rates. So your original question. Um, that's what I see for interest rates. That probably won't change a lot. Maybe it'll tick up a little for the people who follow the bank rates. If banks are charging six and seven now, maybe they'll start originating sixes and sevens. Mm -hmm. What's really good for the seller financed industry is that um, interest rates from banks are similar enough to what a private lender, seller financer would be comfortable lending at. Right. So for that reason, we should see more seller finance paper. And it's harder for borrowers to acquire with uh, uh, qualify with institutional bank. lenders because their debt to income ratios all of a sudden got way. It's more of a stretch because right. the payments got so much higher, going mm -hmm. from a three and a half percent to a seven percent loan. The payments jumped way up. It's yeah. harder to qualify. Mm -hmm. So that also is in favor of more seller finance notes. So we'll definitely see more seller finance notes hitting the market. Okay. So do you think, do you look at the condition of the property before you um, determine whether or not you're going to do a seller finance note? Before selling the seller financing? Right. Before creating a seller finance note. Do you, do you look at the condition of the property? Like, does it matter whether it's in a, a A neighborhood or a B class neighborhood or a war zone? Or <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you a story. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't tend to buy the notes that are in those neighborhoods because I don't want to own the property if mm -hmm. something goes bad. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, it's a little harder to deal with. You probably know a little bit about the Baltimore market. I'm getting you know, some investors there and and everybody I talk to who invests there says, man, it's block by block. Block by block, you know this 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 block is Beirut. This block isn't so bad. It's right, like weird. And then the next block is not so good again. Like, oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I don't know the market, so I wouldn't buy a, a note in Baltimore unless I call someone I know and, and, and trust and can tell me about that block. Um, I just don't want those notes. That's not how I invest. Other people do. Yeah, yeah. Just curious. Um, just curious. I don't. But back to the back to the people who are creating the companies who are creating contract for deeds and putting people in those homes who really couldn't afford to be there. A lot of times they could afford the monthly payment, but they put them in a home that needed a new roof mm -hmm. or had foundation issues or major plumbing it. issues. And that ate them alive, mm -hmm. right? They were either living, you know, in squalor, water coming through the roof. That's not good. Mm -hmm. um, or they just, or they took out other loans to pay for those costs and they, and they suffocated under it. So is it responsible to do that? No. No. That's no. True. So that's that that's important to me. You will not see me in the newspaper for doing yeah. things like that. And and I hope no one here because it it makes us all look bad where that's not the business we're in. We're in the business of whether it's notes or actual property, at the end of the day, we do help people. We help to provide housing yeah, for that's, families and that's the end goal, right? Just keep them in the house. I mean Yeah. Yeah, you have some pain. <laughs> Sabrina Z. Sabrina has that quote I, I love so much. There's a heartbeat in every home. Absolutely. Uh, have you ever heard her say that? I love that quote. I love yeah. that quote. So. Heartbeat in every home. Right, so, cool. so there you go. So that's that's a, a snapshot of the yeah. of the market and the size of the market. I think 2022 might look a little <laughs> bigger. Um, when I get those numbers, I can share them or, or look for them through noteinvestor.com. Okay. Great. All right, so where do you find them? Um, 
Do you market for these? See, I can't remember. Do I mark? I, I have marketed from for them, but I don't have any as of yet. I, I came close with um, a house that I was selling before I moved from, um, well, I sold the house. It was a rental and then I sold it in Virginia and I came close to, um, that's where I actually even heard about seller financing because it was on the market for a little bit because it was a big house. And um, someone said to me, why don't you just do um, offer seller financing on it? And I'm like, well, what is that? <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. But as it was explained to me, then I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, I could get somebody to do a down payment and, you know, find a, a untraditional buyer, maybe a doctor or somebody or another investor that, you know, wanted to buy the house and had a large down payment. And, and you know, because I wanted to get my capital out of the house to buy notes. And <laughs> so and uh, so that's where I learned about um, seller finance. But then I ended up with a traditional buyer that bought it. But yeah, I had even had my realtor um, uh, advertise, you know, that the, the seller will seller finance it for you <laughs> and all that. So I'm like, oh, okay. So yeah, that's that's where I got my first. That's, see, that's when we met. You were you Seven you five. were trying to, to yep. sell that house back then. Yeah, that's when we yep. first talked. I remember. So, I remember. Yeah, it, it ended up selling traditional with a traditional buyer, but yeah, wow. that's that's where I learned okay. about seller financing. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't I don't think I have a slide on it here, but um, one thing that's really important right now is for investors to understand some of the tax code as it relates to installment sales. Mm -hmm. Installment sale is what the IRS calls seller financing. Mm. So if I have a house that I bought for $200,000 and then I go to sell it to Z for $500,000, I'm minus an exclusion if it's owner occupied. So that's section 121. I highly recommend note investors understand certain parts of the tax code. Okay. Any investor in real estate understands certain parts. Section 121 is an exemption. If if you live in a house for a certain amount of time and it's owner occupied, mm -hmm. you can exempt a certain amount of capital gain. So okay. if I bought it for 200, sold it for 500, if I'm single and I live in it, I can exclude $250,000 in capital gains. Mm -hmm. But if it's a rental, I can't exclude anything yeah. from it. Guess what happens? I get a huge tax bill. If I sell it to Z, yeah. I get a huge tax bill. And even to the point, it's going to push my income into higher brackets. So yeah. some of that's going to be taxed at higher rates. So one way to entice sellers to sell with seller financing is to encourage them to look, to read up, point them in the right direction. Don't be their tax advisor, right? but point them in the right <laughs> direction and say, you know, there's a way to minimize the taxes you pay. First of all, you can spread them out over time. And you may end up actually lessening them because you'll keep yourself in lower tax brackets by doing it. Yeah. And it's seller financing. It's the IRS installment sale, something else you can look up. Yeah. And what it does is takes that capital gain and spreads it out over all the years of the note payments. Right. So the IRS is only going to tax you on the capital gain you realize during a particular tax year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's super powerful. As investors, for all of us, if we do own property, it's super powerful. And um, and the same for um, for sellers. We might want to we might want to buy a house. You know, some of us, me, I I you know I I look for property too. But mm -hmm. um, but some of us might want to buy a house, and it's great to get seller finance terms. That's a great way to entice people. That's cool. Right. Seller financing. Well, so <laughs> um, so where does one find the notes? First of all, I mentioned um, it, uh, uh, Scott Arpan runs a company. Um, uh, no, what is that? What is that company? Advanced Seller Data Services. It was in a previous slide, but okay. um, but and, and there are other businesses out there that do the same thing. I'll, I'll endorse Scott. I used his company, but, mm -hmm. but I'm not. You know, there are other companies too. Um, how does he find that information? Well, remember I said the notes. I mean, not the notes, but the mortgages and deeds of trust, and usually land contracts and contract for deeds are recorded. Well, in searching through county records, if one were to do a search with, with a computer in a database, and then one were to filter out 
all the major banks who are named on the notes, Wells Fargo and so and so and so and so, or it's been put into some big collateralized thing and that shows up on, on the mortgage or, or whatever it is, what's left generally are individual seller finance note holders. So companies like that do those types of searches through all the all the county records. Most most counties across the country are listed available digitally, not all, but most. So, so that's where those lists come from. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to go to the county and do your own search. <laughs> uh, it's pretty affordable. And I know people, you know, back in the day did that, of course, but now you just don't have to. Yeah. Um, but ultimately what those uncover usually are, are mom and pop note holders, or you'll see a certain number of LLCs. Those are mostly investors who sold the seller financing. Right. But, uh, you'll also see trust. Those are those are hard to get to because it's hard to find the address for a trust. So maybe somebody inherited the note and it's held in the name of a trust or inherited the property and they sold the property with seller financing. It's held in the name of a trust or just for just asset protection or liability. To them. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so that's a whole other topic. But mom and pop note holders certainly have a lot of seller finance notes. Uh, some of them um, enter what's called the secondary market. I was describing this to someone the other day. They said, I, my business card says I buy notes in the secondary market. So what's the secondary market? I said, well, if you go to the Ford dealer to buy a car, you're the first buyer of that car, okay? And then you drive it for a year or two, and then you go to sell it, uh, uh, you know, by putting an ad in the, you know, online or something like that, then that's the secondary market. So I buy used notes, I guess you could say. <laughs> Low mileage, no, I don't care <laughs> so you're gonna have to change your logo now <laughs> How about use, i'm a used note buyer <laughs> so websites like paper stack and notes direct you'll see um uh some seller finance listed uh notes listed and that you're now in the secondary market uh investors certainly own them for a while and then sell them i'm going to talk about partials later um for those starting out partials are a good way to start uh, brokers. Uh, I broker some of my notes and I keep some of them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to talk about that process later. And um, of course, you can create your own. Um, you can sell a property. I've done this a couple of times and then just carry back the paper. It's usually for me, that means it's out of state. I don't want to deal with being a landlord out of state, but I think it's a good property for somebody. Is that not the same as seller financing? It is. Yeah, it's the same. They sell the property and carry back the paper. That's yeah. seller financing, right? Carry back. You'll hear some <laughs> of the terms. Owner financing, seller financing. Thanks for bringing that up, see. Seller carry back. You just carry back the financing. That's all that means. Okay. Yep. Yep. So. And then what I do is I market to mom and pops. The most common ways to do this uh, are here. Um if anybody listening to this is in the business of house wholesaling or knows someone who does house wholesaling, the marketing and the talking to sellers is very similar. In fact, sometimes I'll listen in on podcasts and webinars and things of, of real estate investors who are wholesalers of property to learn from them. They're really good at it. There are a lot of them out there and there's a lot of content out there, way more than in the note space, by the way. And what wholesaling is, I've got a slide on this later as an example. No, I don't in this one, but so I'll explain it now. Um, wholesaling is um, Susan calls me, found my ad online, and she has a note. You know, uh, I, I think you know, I think it's time for me to sell it. What would it be worth? We work out a, a price and we get it under contract for fifty thousand dollars, and her balance is seventy thousand, whatever it is. And then I go to Z and I say, Z, I've got this great note. I'm not going to buy it. Uh, is it something you'd want to buy? And she says, sure, I can pay $55,000 for that. And I say, great. And I sign my contract that I have. It's an option agreement that I use. It's a contract. I assign my option agreement with the seller, with Susan. I assign it over to Z. Mm -hmm. And then Z can execute on it. Yeah, she would form her due diligence. Yeah. She would close on it. She would fund it. And then she would take ownership of the asset at closing. And we'd tell the title company when 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 that um, 
when the fifty thousand dollars from Z comes in, send fifty thousand of that to the note holder, and five thousand to me. And that's that's mostly how I that's how I buy groceries. <laughs> 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 that's pretty cool. The more that I do, the better I eat. I like it. That's what I do. So um, that is um, one thing to do with these leads. Um, you can find people by buying lists and sending letters and postcards. Um, you can create a website and do SEO. It takes a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You can shortcut that a little bit by paying for Google Ads. That's a lot of money. Um, I do quite a bit of that, but it took a long time to get that dialed in. Um, there, you'll find a lot of seller finance notes are in tertiary markets. So not in downtown Cincinnati, but maybe somewhere outside downtown Cincinnati. So maybe smaller markets outside of Phoenix, Arizona, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And some of those have local papers still or publications that people pick up at the supermarket. Um, and to be honest, a lot of, especially the mom and pops are 55 plus, they still like to read something in their hand with their coffee or tea in the morning. Um, and classified ads in those publications, we'll, we'll find them. Um, reverse ad marketing is a, is a trick where um, one uh, goes to say Craigslist and looks in the real estate listings for people selling property, offering seller financing. Mm -hmm. Call that ad. Say, I notice you're selling a property here with seller financing. I buy seller finance notes. Do you have any other seller finance notes? Mm -hmm. Have you thought Have you thought about selling any of those? That's cool. Start that documentation. That it takes time to do that, but it's free. Wait, that time, sounds time consuming. It is, but it's free, right? So what free. people starting out often don't have is money for letters and postcards mm -hmm. and Google ads and all that stuff. And they, all might, they might have time. They might have time. Hey, that's right. So you got more time than money. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, and then the last thing is, and this is, this happened for me as I've been in business for a while, I get a certain number of calls from, say, estate attorneys. My client inherited a note and they need to sell it. Could you provide us a bid for that? They're calling on behalf of their client. Um, or um, uh, CPAs uh, have called me too. Same thing. We're... You know, I'm, I'm working with this often high net worth person and they have these assets and, and we're looking for pricing, please. Um, so certain professionals have access to notes. I met a bookkeeper recently at a vendor expo. I was in Maryland last week. See, and and uh, I said, do you have clients? She goes, oh, I do. I said, OK, good. So so that was a good connection. Of course they have clients. <laughs> that have these kind of notes she said now she was at a real estate vendor expo and so of course she has real estate clients so that was a good one that was a good one yeah. <laughs> i hadn't been there awesome. all right so now we're going to go into ways to make money with this do you have any questions right now z no no i think i think i went through all of my questions i didn't realize you were going to get that in depth with it but um i think i'm i think i'm good i, I you answered all of my all right I'm going to go through some ways to make money with these. Um, of course, you can buy them and hold them, just like buying and holding a house. I do huh? have one after all, huh? one I missed. Can you do um, second position notes with seller financing? Yeah, all day long, all day long. There's no difference between whether a Wells Fargo is involved or Marco Barrio is involved. Same documentation, same same possibilities are there. Yeah, all day long. Okay. In fact, you can you can get really creative with terms and create all kinds of weird looking things with seller finance notes. Okay. I bought a note this year where there are no payments due until 2026. <laughs> nice. So I'm just holding it. I bought it, you know, discounted accordingly. <laughs> There's no payments due. However, with each year that goes by, their interest rate goes up. So oh. they do wait to 2026 to pay me. Their interest rate is now much higher than it is right now. Yikes. So it'll be calculated at the higher interest rate. So it's a bit of a game of chicken. I thought it was sort of fun. I, I, now, wait a minute. Was it non-performing and you bought it that way and just waiting on them? No payments are due. It out, so no payments are due. Okay. So it's it's that, that the way it was just structured? Okay. That way? Yeah. Okay. That's right. That's right. Oh, wow. Okay. That's pretty cool. These two really cool. smart young guys. Uh, convinced a, a woman who needed to sell her house 
to sell it to them with seller financing. And those are the terms they negotiated. And they knew they were going to do a major renovation on the house and flip it. So they're like, well, we don't want to be paying anybody on a loan if we don't have to while we're out doing all this construction. And they have day jobs and this is a side hustle for them and yada, yada. Um, so a great, great note in Washington state. I mean, a great home. Well, great neighborhood. The home got torn down. Yeah. But um, so that's what happened. So they, they obviously she wasn't pushing back. So I guess they must have said, great, how's 2026 sound? She said, sure. <laughs> nice <laughs> so then she called me and she needed money sweet 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 woman we we spent a lot of time going back and forth and um her um her husband worked for boeing a design systems you know washington state's got a big boeing contingency mm -hmm. he designed some major systems for the space shuttle and i heard about his whole story and i googled him and found his stuff online it was really neat mm -hmm. but um but yeah so now i hold this note and it just sits there and we'll see if they finish the house. And that, well, <laughs> here's what would have happened, right? If the interest rates are still low, they should be finishing the house soon. If the interest rates were still low, they'd probably want to refinance right. and take cash out of it because now it's worth so much more. But now the interest rates are higher. We'll see what they decide to do. Mm. I don't care. It sits in my retirement account. <laughs> I got a good deal on it. That's pretty cool. But yeah, no, seller finance notes can be weird, really weird. Very cool. So... All right. Um, so ways to make money with them, buy them and collect the payments or not collect the payments in the case of my one note. I don't, that's the only, I only have one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go through the examples of all these. Uh, one I just call buy low, sell high. It's like buy an Apple stock, right? Buy it a hundred bucks a share or whatever it is and sell it for 150. Buy low, sell high. Partials, I'm going to explain partials in the next slide. Okay. Super powerful. Uh, hypothecation, I ended up taking that slide out of here. Okay. Um, Z, if you have questions about it, I can go into it. All right. Hypothecation is simply instead of instead of owning a, a real estate, instead of owning a property and using it as collateral to borrow money, you can do the same thing with a note. With a note. Mm -hmm. Not as common. Um, you're probably going to have to go to a private investor to find that loan, but uh, it does happen. Some some banks do it, but it's a it takes a, a needle in a haystack to find. Yeah, it's not a walk in off the street relationship. Let's right. just say that. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm going to put this here um, to really start learning about real estate investing. I I, I started taking some creative uh, financing and creative investing courses, and a lot of the people who spend time in those circles go to exchange meetings. Exchange meetings literally are people trading real estate for real estate or notes for real estate or quite honestly, a van for real estate, a down payment on real estate, <laughs> trade anything. And it's so eye opening to learn that deals can be made uh, between anything of value and anything of value. Uh, people who teach courses say you can come to my course for free and I'll, you know, if, if you, you know, we can work this deal, yeah. trade anything. Mm -hmm. I'll send 150 postcards for you in exchange for uh, taking your class on wholesaling. Mm -hmm. I've seen those deals made. I've seen all kinds of deals made. Nice. And a really good place to um, get an introduction to the, just the, the, the mindset behind it is go on Google mm -hmm. and Google one red paperclip, ABC 2020. It was a story they did. Mm -hmm. It's about a guy who started with a red paperclip and eventually traded up and got a house. And got a house. I think I saw that story. You're seeing it? It's <laughs> unbelievable. So I'll just mention that people on exchange meetings love notes. They love them. <laughs> I've got a good note. It's, they're making good payments. It's cash every month. You can you can go a long way with some notes on an exchange meeting. So just keep that in mind if you get it. Okay. okay. And people create a lot of notes in those too. All right. So thanks for that. I'm going to cover partials. Um, notes don't have to be sold as whole notes. Notes are, if you think about it, a lot of payments. If there's 100 payments on a note, there's 100 slices of the pie that can be sold one off. But what happens if you bake a pie and sell the whole pie, maybe you sell it for $10, but maybe you can go sell those slices for $4 a piece and make more money. 
It's one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, somebody may not have money to buy the whole pie, but they just want a slice. So they'll come in and say, I got $4 here. Slice. <laughs> Can I get some coffee to go with that? Got a dollar. <laughs> Got a dollar. Well, I'll give you a piece of the crust for a dollar. <laughs> um, and the and when you do that, let's say now I'm selling you um, uh, 36 payments and there are 100 payments left on the note, but just 36. And what you're really buying is uh, $30,000 of the loan balance mm -hmm. and the full loan balance might be 150, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What happens if there's a default? Mm -hmm. Two things. One, we're going to create an amortization schedule for the partial buyer that's different than the full note. So everybody knows who gets what in the, in the event of an early payoff or a default. That's also in the agreement between us. But if there's a default, and there's money that comes in as a result. The house is foreclosed on, it's sold into the you know, real estate market, and now we get a big check. But the check doesn't quite cover the whole balance. Who gets the money first? The partial buyer. Partial buyer. Partial buyer. So in that sense, if I'm selling Z a partial on a first aisle, and that happens, it's like she has a first on my first. She's first in line. She has a first on my first. So partials are safer because there's more equity protection. Equity protections, the, the amount above either your investment or just the note balance. But for us note investors, it's our investment. Okay, so there's more because you're first in line. Does that make sense, Z, that explanation? I like that. <laughs> Very good. So what I... I'm seeking out to do more of, to be honest, as I mature a little bit as an investor, are buying whole notes in my retirement account. We'll see an example of this. And selling a partial to recoup a portion of my investment. Mm -hmm. So if I was able to negotiate to buy a note for $50,000, and then I I can, and Z is interested in, in an investment of, say, $40,000, mm -hmm. I might sell it to her. She might get a little less yield than I got on my discounted purchase, but she's only buying a portion of the balance and what's left over for me. See the picture there of the pie? I might sell her that slice, but I got a whole pie sitting there That's left, right. after she eats her slice. And I'll show you an example of the numbers there, but it's super powerful, especially in retirement accounts. You can really, really inflate their value. So, Notes are always, if you're a smart buyer, mm -hmm. always bought at some discount. Now, I'll warn you, you'll go on paper stack and you might see notes selling at par. I don't recommend you do that. Mm -hmm. I even see notes priced above the balance somehow. I don't recommend you do that either. Mm -hmm. What I recommend you do is buy it at some discount so you have some cushion in there for yourself. Uh, because there are other costs other than just the cost of the note. Um, and because honestly, if there's an early payoff, and I have a slide on this later, you, you do stand to receive a windfall if you paid less than par. And the sooner that payoff comes, the better. But so let me explain how it works. If, you, if, if one were buying a note, someone calls me and they have a $75,000 balance on a note. It's uh, the interest rate 7% on their note. That's the, called the face rate. And the payments are $992 a month and there are hundred payments remaining. I might look at that given all the parameters um, and say, well, I can buy your note for, I can pay you $62,500 roughly for your balance. These are typical, this is what I do all day. People mm -hmm. call me and they have whatever they have. And I say, I can pay you this and the number is going to be less. It's what I do all day. So my yield and for those who don't know the financial calculator, I recommend learning it, mm -hmm. but my yield is 12%. Why? Because I've spent less for the same number of payments at the same monthly payment amount. I still receive what they would have received. The borrower's balance doesn't change, but my investment is less, so my yield is more. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's basic buy and hold.
Now, remember I said I either do one of two things. I mostly in my retirement account, I buy and hold, or not in my retirement account, I wholesale notes. And I do a lot of these deals. So same note comes in. I get it under contract for the same amount, 62.5. But I have an investor who's happy with a 9% yield. So that means they'll send a check, they'll wire funds into closing title company or escrow company of $69,600 roughly. And just like that example I mentioned earlier with Z, the seller, uh, when we close, the title company will wire them $62,500, but they'll send me $7,089. <clears throat> That's wholesaling. It's also called brokering. People sort of, uh, assign different terms to it, but it's it's essentially wholesaling. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, yeah. Or, now this works when it's not in my retirement account, okay? Because I'm running a business here. I don't recommend anybody run a business in the retirement account. Right. Talk to your advisors about that as to why. But one thing you can do in your retirement account is buy shares of Apple for $100 and sell them for $150, right? People do that all day long. <laughs> so why can't you do that with notes? Absolutely. Why can't I buy? I'll fund the deal and I'll take ownership at closing at $62.5. But then maybe I have an investor who's happy with 8% and I go sell it for $72,000. And I and I keep about ten thousand dollars when that when when my second deal is closed. I don't typically do this at the same closing. I would I would take ownership. And I in reality end up collecting a few payments and then sell and, it and then sell it. But you can see it's just buy low, sell high. Buy Apple at one hundred, sell it at one fifty. Mm -hmm. Okay. That works. So here's what I'm starting to do more of in my retirement account. I have a Current same current note. I buy the whole thing at the same sixty two thousand five hundred dollars, but I recapitalize, meaning that I get cash back for some asset that I own mm -hmm. by selling a partial. So maybe I sell to Z, just sixty five of the payments, and she's happy with an eight percent yield. Mm -hmm. So she's going to pay me for the sixty five payments, fifty two thousand one eighty eight. When the 65 payments are made, assuming they're all made per the schedule, and her balance now that she's due is zero, the note reverts back to me. When that happens, the borrower still owes me $31,323. Now, I only had $10,000 left in the deal. You can work the numbers a lot of different ways. Sometimes you're lucky and you can work numbers where you have zero left in the deal and your return is ultimately infinite. Mm -hmm. So this, this is a, 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 no business is mostly hitting singles and doubles. Mm -hmm. You'll see a lot of people show you these huge deals they've done. Yeah. I got a couple, but I'm not showing you those today. Yeah. I do these all day long. <laughs> this is how I run my business and it all adds up. We just keep piling them up and it all adds up to good money. That's pretty cool. So... That is buying a full and selling a partial. So I can take a little, a certain amount of money in a retirement account, and I can basically spend it over and over and over again until I've got this big remaining, they call it the remainderman interest on a partial, that remaining balance, you see 31323 mm -hmm. And what will happen is those will start coming in over time. In fact, some of these notes will pay off early and will come in sooner than you think. And uh, and then you go just reinvest it, just keep doing it. That's pretty cool. The last one I've got is to show what happens in the event of an early payoff. This is this is just a nice single. There's some big ones that happen from time to time. Same. Uh, this oh, I did fudge the numbers a little. This current note was a five percent rate. Uh, payments nine eighteen a month. One hundred payments remaining. Mm -hmm. I buy a full at a ten percent yield to buy and hold because I'm going to collect payments. So I collect payments, 36 of them come in. And then, oh, and I, and over those 36 payments, I've received $33,000. So I have half my money's back, a little more than half my money's come back. 
in three years. Then my favorite email pops up. <laughs> it's my note. It's my servicer saying they want to pay off the note. <laughs> say, darn, I hate that. <laughs> say, darn it, I got extra money coming in. <laughs> Oh, uh, really? Okay. Well, go I've been making a 10% yield. <laughs> and they say, well, the payoff amount is 51726 I say, okay. When are they sending the money? And they send the money in. And ultimately, in three years' time, now, I received $33,000 by collecting payments. And I got a almost $52,000 payoff. Okay, on my $62,000 investment. In three years' time, I profited $22,636. And my, my, my yield is in 10%. It's 12.9. And if you don't understand that, learn the financial calculator. Okay. But I'll explain to you the reason that is, is because money now is worth more than money later. And because uh, the beginning payments of a note are mostly interest. So that's that's how amortization works. So what's left on the back end is still quite a bit of principal because that pays off much, much more slowly. That's, those are all the slides I've got. That just means I need to work on getting some early payoffs. <laughs> well, they were happening a lot when interest rates were low because we had borrowers whose credit scores were going up hopefully and they were refinancing the, and, the, and the property and their property values were going up so they were in a position to go refinance at a low interest rate mm -hmm. and more payoffs were coming in yeah. the early payoffs will slow down for a little bit yeah. but we'll get back there again yeah absolutely well marco i appreciate this this is awesome so much information so everybody here's marco's um information um actually all of this information um, actually, this video will be posted across all the social media, all the Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, everywhere you can find me. And uh, Marco will be tagged in those posts and his information will be available for anybody that needs to contact him and or myself. And um, also my YouTube will be open for any additional questions that you might have since this is being pre-recorded, a little bit different from my previous um way that I used to do my interviews, however. Um, great information nonetheless, Marco, I appreciate it. This was fun, this was fun.